Part six of Chapter eleven of Book one of the Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part six of Chapter eleven of Book one of the Rent of Land. Different effects of the progress of improvement upon three different sorts of rude produce. These different sorts of rude produce may be divided into three classes. The first comprehends those which it is scarce in the power of human industry to multiply at all. The second, those which it can multiply in proportion to the demand. The third, those in which the efficacy of industry is either limited or uncertain. In the progress of wealth and improvement, the real price of the first may rise to any degree of extravagance, and seems not to be limited by any certain boundary. That of the second, though it may rise greatly, has, however, a certain boundary, beyond which it cannot well pass for any considerable time together. That of the third, though its natural tendency is to rise in the progress of improvement, yet in the same degree of improvement it may sometimes happen even to fall, sometimes to continue the same, and sometimes to rise more or less, according as different accidents render the efforts of human industry, in multiplying this sort of rude produce more or less successful. First Sort the first sort of rude produce of which the price rises in the progress of improvement is that which it is scarce in the power of human industry to multiply at all it consists in those things which nature produces only in certain quantities and which being of a very perishable nature it is impossible to accumulate together the produce of many different seasons such are the greater part of rare and singular birds and fishes many different sorts of game almost all wild fowl all birds of passage in particular, as well as many other things. When wealth and the luxury which accompanies it increase, the demand for these is likely to increase with them, and no effort of human industry may be able to increase the supply much beyond what it was before this increase of the demand. The quantity of such commodities, therefore, remaining the same, or nearly the same, while the competition to purchase them is continually increasing, their price may rise to any degree of extravagance, and seems not to be limited by any certain boundary. If woodcocks should become so fashionable as to sell for twenty guineas apiece, no effort of human industry could increase the number of those brought to market, much beyond what it is at present. The high price paid by the Romans, in the time of their greatest grandeur, for rare birds and fishes, may in this manner easily be accounted for. These prices were not the effects of the low value of silver in those times, but of the high value of such rarities and curiosities as human industry could not multiply at pleasure. The real value of silver was higher at Rome, for some time before and after the fall of the Republic, than it is through the greater part of Europe at present. Three sesterti, equal to about sixpence sterling, was the price which the Republic paid for the modius or peck of the tithe wheat of Sicily. This price, however, was probably below the average market price, the obligation to deliver their wheat at this rate being considered as a tax upon the Sicilian farmers. When the Romans, therefore, had occasion to order more corn than the tithe of wheat amounted to, they were bound by capitulation to pay for the surplus at the rate of four sesterti, or eight pence sterling the peck, and this had probably been reckoned the moderate and reasonable, that is, the ordinary or average contract price of those times, it is equal to about one and twenty shillings the quarter. Eight and twenty shillings the quarter was, before the late years of scarcity, the ordinary contract price of English wheat, which in quality is inferior to the Sicilian, and generally sells for a lower price in the European market. The value of silver, therefore, in those ancient times, must have been to its value in the present, as three to four inversely, that is, three ounces of silver would then have purchased the same quantity of labor and commodities, which four ounces will do at present. When we read in Pliny, therefore, that Sayus bought a white nightingale as a present for the Empress Agrippina, at the price of six thousand sesterti, equal to about fifty pounds of our present money, and that Asinius Seller purchased a sermolet at the price of eight thousand sesterti, equal to about sixty-six pounds, thirteen shillings, and fourpence of our present money, the extravagance of those prices, how much soever it may surprise us, is apt, notwithstanding, to appear to us about one-third less than it really was. Their real price, the quantity of labor and subsistence which was given away for them, was about one-third more than their nominal price is apt to express to us in the present times. 
Sayus gave for the nightingale the command of a quantity of labor and subsistence equal to what sixty six pounds thirteen shillings fourpence would purchase in the present times, and Asinius Seller gave for a sermolet the command of a quantity equal to what eighty eight pounds seventeen shillings ninepence would purchase. What occasioned the extravagance of those high prices was not so much the abundance of silver as the abundance of labor and subsistence, of which those Romans had the disposal beyond what was necessary for their own use. The quantity of silver of which they had the disposal was a good deal less than what the command of the same quantity of labor and subsistence would have procured to them in the present times. Second Sort the second sort of rude produce of which the price rises in the progress of improvement is that which human industry can multiply in proportion to the demand it consists in those useful plants and animals which in uncultivated countries nature produces with such profuse abundance that they are of little or no value and which as cultivation advances are therefore forced to give place to some more profitable produce during a long period in the progress of improvement, the quantity of these is continually diminishing, while, at the same time, the demand for them is continually increasing. Their real value, therefore, the real quantity of labor which they will purchase or command, gradually rises, till at last it gets so high as to render them as profitable a produce as anything else which human industry can raise upon the most fertile and best cultivated land. When it has got so high, it cannot well go higher if it did more land and more industry would soon be employed to increase their quantity when the price of cattle for example rises so high that it is as profitable to cultivate land in order to raise food for them as in order to raise food for man it cannot well go higher if it did more corn land would soon be turned into pasture the extension of tillage by diminishing the quantity of wild pasture diminishes the quantity of butcher's meat which the country naturally produces without labor or cultivation and by increasing the number of those who have either corn or what comes to the same thing the price of corn to give in exchange for it increases the demand the price of butcher's meat therefore and consequently of cattle must gradually rise till it gets so high that it becomes as profitable to employ the most fertile and best cultivated lands in raising food for them as in raising corn but it must always be late in the progress of improvement before tillage can be so far extended as to raise the price of cattle to this height and till it has got to this height if the country is advancing at all their price must be continually rising there are perhaps some parts of europe in which the price of cattle has not yet got to this height it had not got to this height in any part of scotland before the union had the scotch cattle been always confined to the market of scotland in a country in which the quantity of land which can be applied to no other purpose but the feeding of cattle is so great in proportion to what can be applied to other purposes it is scarce possible perhaps that their price could ever have risen so high as to render it profitable to cultivate land for the sake of feeding them in england the price of cattle it has already been observed seems in the neighbourhood of london to have got to this height about the beginning of the last century but it was much later probably before it got through the greater part of the remoter counties and some of which perhaps it may scarce yet have got to it of all the different substances however which compose the second sort of rude produce cattle is perhaps that of which the price in the progress of improvement rises first to this height till the price of cattle indeed has got to this height it seems scarce possible that the greater part even of those lands which are capable of the highest cultivation can be completely cultivated in all farms too distant from any town to carry manure from it that is in the far greater part of those of every extensive country the quantity of well cultivated land must be in proportion to the quantity of manure which the farm itself produces and this again must be in proportion to the stock of cattle which are maintained upon it the land is manured either by pasturing the cattle upon it or by feeding them in the stable and from thence carrying out their dung to it but unless the price of the cattle be sufficient to pay both the rent and profit of cultivated land the farmer cannot afford to pasture them upon it and he can still less afford to feed them in the stable it is with the produce of improved and cultivated land only that cattle can be fed in the stable because to collect the scanty and scattered produce of waste and unimproved lands would require too much labor and be too expensive if the price of the cattle therefore is not sufficient to pay for the produce of improved and cultivated land when they are allowed to pasture it that price will be still less sufficient to pay for that produce when it must be collected with a good deal of additional labor and brought into the stable to them <laughs> 
in these circumstances therefore no more cattle can with profit be fed in the stable than what are necessary for tillage but these can never afford manure enough for keeping constantly in good condition all the lands which they are capable of cultivating what they afford being insufficient for the whole farm will naturally be reserved for the lands to which it can be most advantageously or conveniently applied the most fertile or those perhaps in the neighbourhood of the farmyard these therefore will be kept constantly in good condition and fit for tillage the rest will the greater part of them be allowed to lie waste producing scarce anything but some miserable pasture just sufficient to keep alive a few straggling half-starved cattle the farm though much overstocked in proportion to what would be necessary for its complete cultivation being very frequently overstocked in proportion to its actual produce a portion of this waste land however after having been pastured in this wretched manner for six or seven years together may be ploughed up when it will yield perhaps a poor crop or two of bad oats or of some other coarse grain and then being entirely exhausted it must be rested and pastured again as before and another portion ploughed up to be in the same manner exhausted and rested again in its turn such accordingly was the general system of management all over the low country of scotland before the union the lands which were kept constantly well manured and in good condition seldom exceeded a third or fourth part of the whole farm and sometimes did not amount to a fifth or a sixth part of it the rest were never manured but a certain portion of them was in its turn notwithstanding regularly cultivated and exhausted under this system of management it is evident even that part of the lands of scotland which is capable of good cultivation could produce but little in comparison of what it may be capable of producing but how disadvantageous soever this system may appear yet before the union the low price of cattle seems to have rendered it almost unavoidable if notwithstanding a great rise in the price it still continues to prevail through a considerable part of the country it is owing in many places no doubt to ignorance and attachment to old customs but in most places to the unavoidable obstructions which the natural course of things opposes to the immediate or speedy establishment of a better system first to the poverty of the tenants to their not having yet had time to acquire a stock of cattle sufficient to cultivate their lands more completely the same rise of price which would render it advantageous for them to maintain a greater stock rendering it more difficult for them to acquire it and secondly to their not having yet had time to put their lands in condition to maintain this greater stock properly supposing they were capable of acquiring it the increase of stock and the improvement of land are two events which must go hand in hand and of which the one can nowhere much outrun the other without some increase of stock there can be scarce any improvement of land but there can be no considerable increase of stock but in consequence of a considerable improvement of land because otherwise the land could not maintain it these natural obstructions to the establishment of a better system cannot be removed but by a long course of frugality and industry and a half a century or century more perhaps must pass away before the old system which is wearing out gradually can be completely abolished through all the different parts of the country of all the commercial advantages however which scotland has derived from the union with england this rise in the price of cattle is perhaps the greatest it has not only raised the value of all highland estates but it has perhaps been the principal cause of the improvement of the low country in all new colonies the great quantity of waste land which can for many years be applied to no other purpose but the feeding of cattle soon renders them extremely abundant and in everything great cheapness is the necessary consequence of great abundance though all the cattle of the european colonies in america were originally carried from europe they soon multiplied so much there and became of so little value that even horses were allowed to run wild in the woods without any owner thinking it worth while to claim them it must be a long time after the first establishment of such colonies before it can become profitable to feed cattle upon the produce of cultivated land the same causes therefore the want of manure and the disproportion between the stock employed in cultivation and the land which it is destined to cultivate are likely to introduce there a system of husbandry not unlike that which still continues to take place in so many parts of scotland mr calm the swedish traveller when he gives an account of the husbandry of some of the english colonies in north america as he found it in seventeen forty nine observes accordingly that he can with difficulty discover there the character of the english nation so well skilled in all the different branches of agriculture they make scarce any manure for their cornfields he says but when one piece of ground has been exhausted by continual cropping they clear and cultivate another piece of fresh land 
and when that is exhausted, proceed to a third. Their cattle are allowed to wander through the woods and other uncultivated grounds, where they are half-starved, having long ago extirpated almost all the annual grasses, by cropping them too early in the spring, before they had time to form their flowers, or to shed their seeds. The annual grasses were, it seems, the best natural grasses in that part of North America, and when the Europeans first settled there, they used to grow very thick, and to rise three or four feet high. A piece of ground which, when he wrote, could not maintain one cow, would in former times, he was assured, have maintained four, each of which would have given four times the quantity of milk which that one was capable of giving. The poorness of the pasture had, in his opinion, occasioned the degradation of their cattle, which degenerated sensibly from one generation to another. They were probably not unlike that stunted breed which was common all over Scotland thirty or forty years ago, and which is now so much mended through the greater part of the low country, not so much by a change of the breed, though that expedient has been employed in some places, as by a more plentiful method of feeding them. Though it is late, therefore, in the progress of improvement, before cattle can bring such a price as to render it profitable to cultivate land for the sake of feeding them, yet of all the different parts which compose this second sort of rude produce, they are perhaps the first which bring this price, because, till they bring it, it seems impossible that improvement can be brought near even to that degree of perfection to which it has arrived in many parts of Europe. As cattle are among the first, so perhaps venison is among the last parts of this sort of rude produce which bring this price. The price of venison in Great Britain, how extravagant soever it may appear, is not near sufficient to compensate the expense of a deer park, as is well known to all those who have had any experience in the feeding of deer. If it was otherwise, the feeding of deer would soon become an article of common farming, in the same manner as the feeding of those small birds, called turdi, was among the ancient Romans. Varro and Columella assures us that it was a most profitable article. The fattening of ortolans, birds of passage which arrive lean in the country, is said to be so in some parts of France. If venison continues in fashion, and the wealth and luxury of Great Britain increase as they have done for some time past, its price may very probably rise still higher than it is at present. Between that period and the progress of improvement, which brings to its height the price of so necessary an article as cattle, and that which brings it to the price of such a superfluity as venison, there is a very long interval, in the course of which many other sorts of rude produce gradually arrive at their highest price, some sooner and some later, according to different circumstances. Thus, in every farm, the offals of the barn and stable will maintain a certain number of poultry. These, as they are fed with what would otherwise be lost, are a mere save-all, and as they cost the farmer scarce anything, so he can afford to sell them for very little. Almost all that he gets is pure gain, and their price can scarce be so low as to discourage him from feeding this number. But in countries cultivated, and therefore but thinly inhabited, the poultry, which are thus raised without expense, are often fully sufficient to supply the whole demand. In this state of things, therefore, they are often as cheap as butcher's meat, or any other sort of animal food. But the whole quantity of poultry which the farm in this manner produces without expense must always be much smaller than the whole quantity of butcher's meat which is reared upon it, and in times of wealth and luxury, what is rare, with only nearly equal merit, is always preferred to what is common. As wealth and luxury increase, therefore, in consequence of improvement and cultivation, the price of poultry gradually rises above that of butcher's meat, till at last it gets so high that it becomes profitable to cultivate land for the sake of feeding them. When it has got to this height, it cannot well go higher. If it did, more land would soon be turned to this purpose. In several provinces of France, the feeding of poultry is considered as a very important article in rural economy, and sufficiently profitable to encourage the farmer to raise a considerable quantity of Indian corn and buckwheat for this purpose. A middling farmer will there sometimes have four hundred fowls in his yard. The feeding of poultry seems scarce yet to be generally considered as a matter of so much importance in England. They are certainly, however, dearer in England than in France, as England receives considerable supplies from France. In the progress of improvements, the period at which every particular sort of animal food is dearest must naturally be that which immediately precedes the general practice of cultivating land for the sake of raising it. For some time before this practice becomes general, the scarcity must necessarily raise the price, 
after it has become general new methods of feeding are commonly fallen upon which enable the farmer to raise upon the same quantity of ground a much greater quantity of that particular sort of animal food the plenty not only obliges him to sell cheaper but in consequence of these improvements he can afford to sell cheaper for if he could not afford it the plenty would not be of long continuance it has been probably in this manner that the introduction of clover turnips carrots cabbages etc has contributed to sink the common price of butcher's meat in the london market somewhat below what it was about the beginning of the last century the hog that finds his food among order and greedily devours many things rejected by every other useful animal is like poultry originally kept as a save all as long as the number of such animals which can thus be reared at little or no expense is fully sufficient to supply the demand this sort of butcher's meat comes to market at a much lower price than any other but when the demand rises beyond what this quantity can supply when it becomes necessary to raise food on purpose for feeding and fattening hogs in the same manner as for feeding and fattening other cattle the price necessarily rises and becomes proportionably either higher or lower than that of other butcher's meat according as the nature of the country and the state of its agriculture happen to render the feeding of hogs more or less expensive than that of other cattle in france according to mr buffon the price of pork is nearly equal to that of beef in most parts of great britain it is at present somewhat higher the great rise in the price both of hogs and poultry has in great britain been frequently imputed to the diminution of the number of cottagers and other small occupiers of land an event which has in every part of europe been the immediate forerunner of improvement and better cultivation but which at the same time may have contributed to raise the price of those articles both somewhat sooner and somewhat faster than it would otherwise have risen as the poorest family can often maintain a cat or dog without any expense so the poorest occupiers of land can commonly maintain a few poultry or a sow and a few pigs at very little the little offals of their own table their whey skimmed milk and buttermilk supply those animals with a part of their food and they find the rest in the neighbouring fields without doing any sensible damage to anybody by diminishing the number of those small occupiers therefore the quantity of this sort of provisions which is thus produced at little or no expense must certainly have been a good deal diminished and their price must consequently have been raised both sooner and faster than it would otherwise have risen sooner or later however in the progress of improvement it must at any rate have risen to the utmost height of which it is capable of rising or to the price which pays the labour and expense of cultivating the land which furnishes them with food as well as these are paid upon the greater part of other cultivated land the business of the dairy like the feeding of hogs and poultry is originally carried on as a save all the cattle necessarily kept upon the farm produce more milk than either the rearing of their own young or the consumption of the farmer's family requires and they produce most at one particular season but of all the productions of land milk is perhaps the most perishable in the warm season when it is most abundant it will scarce keep four and twenty hours the farmer by making it into fresh butter stores a small part of it for a week by making it into salt butter for a year and by making it into cheese he stores a much greater part of it for several years part of all these is reserved for the use of his own family the rest goes to market in order to find the best price which is to be had and which can scarce be so low as to discourage him from sending thither whatever is over and above the use of his own family if it is very low indeed he will be likely to manage his dairy in a very slovenly and dirty manner and will scarce perhaps think it worth while to have a particular room or building on purpose for it but will suffer the business to be carried on amidst the smoke filth and nastiness of his own kitchen as was the case of almost all the farmers dairies in scotland thirty or forty years ago and as is the case of many of them still the same causes which gradually raise the price of butcher's meat the increase of the demand and in consequence of the improvement of the country the diminution of the quantity which can be fed at little or no expense raise in the same manner that of the produce of the dairy of which the price naturally connects with that of butcher's meat or with the expense of feeding cattle the increase of price pays for more labour care and cleanliness the dairy becomes more worthy of the farmer's attention and the quality of its produce gradually improves the price at last gets so high that it becomes worth while to employ some of the most fertile and best cultivated lands in feeding cattle merely for the purpose of the dairy and when it has got to this height it cannot well go higher if it did more land would soon be turned to this purpose 
it seems to have got to this height through the greater part of england where much good land is commonly employed in this manner if you accept the neighbourhood of a few considerable towns it seems not yet to have got to this height anywhere in scotland where common farmers seldom employ much good land in raising food for cattle merely for the purpose of the dairy the price of the produce though it has risen very considerably within these few years is probably still too low to admit of it the inferiority of the quality indeed compared with that of the produce of english dairies is fully equal to that of the price but this inferiority of quality is perhaps rather the effect of this lowness of price than the cause of it though the quality was much better the greater part of what is brought to market could not i apprehend in the present circumstances of the country be disposed of at a much better price and the present price it is probable would not pay the expense of the land and labour necessary for producing a much better quality through the greater part of england notwithstanding the superiority of price the dairy is not reckoned a more profitable employment of land than the raising of corn or the fattening of cattle the two great objects of agriculture through the greater part of scotland therefore it cannot yet be even so profitable the lands of no country it is evident can ever be completely cultivated and improved till once the price of every produce which human industry is obliged to raise upon them has got so high as to pay for the expense of complete improvement and cultivation in order to do this the price of each particular produce must be sufficient first to pay the rent of good corn land as it is that which regulates the rent of the greater part of other cultivated land and secondly to pay the labour and expense of the farmer as well as they are commonly paid upon good corn land or in other words to replace with the ordinary profits the stock which he employs about it this rise in the price of each particular produce must evidently be previous to the improvement and cultivation of the land which is destined for raising it gain is the end of all improvement and nothing could deserve that name of which loss was to be the necessary consequence but loss must be the necessary consequence of improving land for the sake of a produce of which the price could never bring back the expense if the complete improvement and cultivation of the country be as it most certainly is the greatest of all public advantages this rise in the price of all those different sorts of rude produce instead of being considered as a public calamity ought to be regarded as the necessary forerunner and attendant of the greatest of all public advantages this rise too in the nominal or money price of all those different sorts of rude produce has been the effect not of any degradation in the value of silver but of a rise in their real price they have become worth not only a greater quantity of silver but a greater quantity of labour and subsistence than before as it costs a greater quantity of labour and subsistence to bring them to market so when they are brought thither they represent or are equivalent to a greater quantity End of Book 1, Chapter 11, Part 6